Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds today. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Albert Waldo as our Grand Rounds speaker today. Dr. Waldo is an internationally known giant in the field of medicine due to his decades of huge contributions in the fields of electrophysiology, cardiology, and internal medicine. He's actually been referred to as the father of atrial fibrillation. Dr. Waldo received his medical degree from SUNY Downstate. He went on to complete internal medicine residency and chief residency in Baltimore City before pursuing cardiology and electrophysiology fellowships at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. He currently holds the title of the Walter H. Pritchard Professor of Cardiology, Professor of Medicine, and Professor of Biochemical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He is also Associate Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine for Academic Affairs here at UHCMC. He is a founding member and past president of the North American Society of Pacing Electrophysiology, now called the Heart Rhythm Society, and has served as president of the Cardiac Electrophysiology Society and the Ohio chapter of American College of Cardiology, or ACC. Dr. Waldo's research in the field of cardiac arrhythmias is well known, vast, and unparalleled. He has over 400 publications and, in 1997, an article written by him titled Demonstration of the Mechanism of Transient Entrapment of Ventricular Tachycardia with Rapid Atrial Pacing was selected by the ACC as one of the 14 influential historical articles in the past as part of the ACC's 50th anniversary, uh, yeah, ACC's 15th anniversary. He has participated in 78 clinical trials, including sitting on steering committees, executive committees, and planning committees, data and safety and monitoring boards, and as a principal investigator. He has received numerous research, teaching, and lifetime achievement awards. He is also a member on the editorial board of most peer-reviewed journals in the field, including but not limited to Circulation, Jack. American Journal of Cardiology and Pacing Clinical Electrophysiology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Waldo. Thank you very much. After an introduction like that, I'll come back next week, I think. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm going to use my maps to do some pointing. I think I can do that. <clears throat> can you all hear me? So this, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, this this is a fun lecture for me, and he usually asks me to do it uh, once every year. So this is in many ways an update. But uh, I, I think the atrial fibrillation, uh, so probably all of you already recognize, is very very common, very very important part of of medicine, and particularly in the elderly. I'll show, show you that in a moment. These are my disclosures. So I often like to start with all those rules because they really apply, some of them really apply here. Perfect's the enemy of good. I think you, you will learn that if you don't already know it, with, uh, especially with HU fib. Things are never as good as they seem or as bad as they seem. That's going to happen. It's Murphy's second law, by the way. His first law, we all know. If something can go wrong, it will. But the second law is pretty good, too. A dog's a four-legged animal, but not every four-legged animal is a dog. In other words, no, not all fibs the same. And don't just do something, stand there. That's not a bad thing. It used to be the motto of the arrhythmia service here. And finally, and maybe the most important, most things in life anyway, this is from Tennyson. He said, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. And you need you need some of that when you're taking care of atrial fib. So when we're talking about atrial fibrillation, today we're going to be talking not about rate control per se, or stroke prevention, both important, but we're going to be talking about the maintenance of sinus rhythm, which is done... Uh, several ways. The pharmacologic with the antiarrhythmic drugs. I've circled the 1Cs and the class 3s. We'll show them in a moment because virtually uh, infrequently the 1As are used, quinine and procainamol and, and, and the like. But also the non-pharmacologic means have become very important, especially catheter ablation in the surgical maze procedure. So just a little background. I think that this is really an important point, place to start. Uh, the Framingham uh, a study in, uh, in Massachusetts that has contributed many, many things, and this is one of the most important in my judgment. Uh, they looked at uh, a, a, a people from after World War II uh, to back to, to the, I think it was to the year 2000, but you can see there are almost 4,000 men and almost 5,000 women. I won't go through all this, but the bottom line is uh, people entered from the age of 40 onward, and you can see that one out of every four people got atrial fibrillation in their lifetime, one out of every four. And then it was interesting, if you look at this, if, the, if they didn't have heart failure, it was one out of every five. 
And so he didn't have heart failure or congestive heart failure. It was one out of every six. And there's a real message here, really, which is think modifiable risk factors. You've got to treat them. This is a long list, and I could go through this whole list and make a whole lecture out of it. But there, there are many, many, many. The hypertension you could really treat. Valvular heart disease you could do things about. Heart failure we're so much better at now. And, and the like, the most recent one we put on is obesity. But inflammation is really, it's really remarkable how many times inflammation is really a part of this and people don't even recognize it. The most obvious is atrial fibrillation we see following open heart surgery. Uh, it's almost uh, anywhere from 35 to 65% of patients, depending on what series you look at, get that. So the bottom line is think modifiable risk factors. There are more on this side, too. We'll get to some of them. Now, we wish we had a good drug to treat atrial fibrillation. I call it idealized. If it was, it would be highly effective, atrial selective, no proarrhythmia or organ toxicity, safe in patients with structural heart disease, no drug device or food interactions, parenteral preparation would be available, once daily dosing would be available you know, at a moderate price, and you can initiate as an outpatient. But if there, if there were such a, a, a drug, there probably would never have been a rate versus rhythm control trial, which I'm going to show you in a moment. I mean, but what we do know is that for a very, very long time, if a patient presented to the doctor's office with atrial fibrillation, the mantra always was, well, we'll do our best to maintain sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation with rate control is a fallback, a fallback ventricular rate control. So these are the drugs that have been around and still are. The class 1A drugs, quinidine, procan, amide, disipermide, these drugs are almost never used anymore, except disipermide is a vagolytic drug, and it turns out we won't have time to get into that today much, but there's a, such a thing as vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation, and this drug is a very good uh, vagolytic, vagolytic, vasolytic drug. So um, it's often used for that. The 1C drugs are very common, flecainide, propofenone, and the long-acting propofenone, and the class 3 drugs, amiodarone, dofetilide, dronetarone, and sotalol. Now, it's interesting if you want to see how, which, which drugs have been approved by the FDA for this, you're going to see one is conspicuously missing. It's the one that's used the most often around the world and in the United States as well, amiodarone. If you look here, to convert atrial fib to sinus rhythm, ibutilide is approved, quinidine, and dofetilide. Dofetilide is, now people don't realize, a very good drug. 40% of people who take it get converted with it less than 24 hours. But if you want to prevent the recurrence of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in patients without structural heart disease, you have the, the 1Cs, flecainide, propofenone, propofenone, SR, quinidine, and sotalol. You see, that, that's quite limited compared to the drugs available I showed you before. And then if you want to prevent relapse of atrial fib, then it's just quinidine, dofetilide, and sotalol that are approved. Dronetarone, which is the last of the drugs that was approved in the, it was in the 21st century, um, it, it's an amiodarone with less toxicity, it was thought, is only approved to reduce the risk of hospitalization for, uh, for, uh, for patients with sinus rhythm with a history of paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. So these are, this, the FDA, you know, is data-driven, and this is what we have. We don't have amiodarone. I don't know if any of you know how amiodarone was introduced into this country. It's worth the story. It actually came from Cleveland, from Metro. There was a guy who brought it in. That the, it was it started in Belgium. Sanofi was using it, uh, using the drug for other things, but they, and giving it to patients. They noticed the PVCs disappeared, so they decided to use it on patients. And sure enough, they were, so it was effective in treating ventricular tachycardia and the like. This was the late 70s and early 80s when we didn't have devices, we didn't have cardiac bypass, we didn't have all these things that we've, we've learned to. Uh, uh, to treat and or prevent coronary artery disease and the like, treat heart failure. And so this drug was widely used, but it wasn't in the United States. So it was brought in here in Cleveland and it quickly spread to all over. You could get the drug. You had to put in a new drug application, so-called an NDA. Well, the FDA knew about this, and they went to Sanofi, and they said, look, why don't you do a clinical trial? We'll approve you with, based on the data, and then... Um, you can uh, you, you, you can be uh, given the drug with an indication, and this was all for ventricular tachycardia. By the way, we had we didn't have defibrillators, we didn't have uh, all the things we have now. So um, the, uh, the the Sanofi said no. What we're going to do is going to take the drug back. You know, it's going to have it. So there was a hue and cry from the medical community, and Amiodarone got approved for for, life, for treatment of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. That's it. 
So every time you use amiodarone, you're using it out of indication. And with all the conflict of interest things, I have to say that to you. We're talking about amiodarone out of, out of interest, but it's in all the guidelines. It's widely accepted and um, kind of interesting history. But we'll talk some more about amiodarone anyway. Well, the bottom line is that there are no drugs that are really ideal for atrial fibrillation. They're all about the same. Maybe amiodarone's a little bit better. This is a study I chose deliberately because Harry Krines is a very good guy in the Netherlands, careful. And this was published in 1994. And you notice with no drug, he had a, the, the sinus rhythm retention rate was nothing in his trial. And, and, and if you look at, uh, he put this together from the, the different trials. And if you look at quinidine, disopyramide, propofenone, flecainide, subtle amiodarone, Look at the recurrence rates. And um, the, the bottom line is that atrial fibrillation tends to recur whatever you do, including amiodarone. Now, the most recent drug was dronetarone. And uh, you can still see, this is just adding dronetarone, which is in this color here. And it hasn't changed. Amiodarone is still the best. And all these other drugs don't do very well. But now we're going to get to the affirm trial, which really changed how we, th I think, how we think about atrial fibrillation as treatment. So as I said before, before the AFFIRM trial, if you had atrial fibrillation, every physician virtually everywhere said, okay, we'll do our best to maintain sinus rhythm. If we can't, then the fallback is rate control. Well, the, the, uh, the AFFIRM trial decided to test which was one was better than the other. And it was uh, people with atrial fibrillation and at least one additional risk factor for stroke were randomized uh, into the trial, and uh, one was to treat them with a uh, uh, an antirhythmic drug, and one was to just keep them on rate control with anticoagulation. And when the trial ended, these were the data that there was the, the all cause mortality actually was a little worse on rhythm control. It separated after about one and two thirds years. It didn't reach significance, it was close. It was actually 0.076. The FDA, uh, the, the New England Journal, he rounded it off to eight. But it wasn't significant, but it was, uh, um, uh, it was uh, something going on there. And when we looked at the data in the AFFIRM trial, it turns out that there was significantly more total deaths in the rhythm control arm. And when you looked, at the non-cardiovascular were highly significantly different. And when you look at what that was, it was cancer and it was pulmonary disease. Now, we know that amiodarone causes pulmonary fibrosis and more things, and more things than that. We have a little lecture on that if you want. But it turns out this was the third straight large study randomized trial where amiodarone was associated with cancer. We didn't anticipate this in the trial. We have no idea what kind of cancer it was. The two large trials, another NIH trial um, on ventricular tachycardia in which amiodarone was one of the options. And then there was the, the European myocardial infarction trial in which they gave amiodarone to patients after myocardial infarct with ventricular arrhythmias. So I say this because we don't have we can get to this in questions really. Ambidrone is an important drug. I think it's used like water sometimes inappropriately. It is not often uh, the treatment of first choice in my opinion, and uh, it has consequences, um, myriad consequences. In fact, about um, I don't know how many years ago it is now. It could be as long as a decade. The FDA mandated that all new prescriptions. Amiodarone patients be given a two side it's a two sided page showing all the all the adverse effects of amiodarone. They're significant. It's a like it's a, it's a, uh, most obvious it's an iodinated compound, either the hyper or hypothyroidism, but the other things as well. In any event, there's some sub studies from the Affirm trial which I think were very, very enlightening. So back in nineteen ninety five when this started, uh two things happened. But the thing I want to talk about now is that if you had atrial fibrillation despite the drug therapy it was considered failure, but the AFFIRM trial was a strategy. It said if you have atrial fibrillation cardiovascular patient and keep them on the drug or go to drug B, but maintain the strategy, don't just give up. And so it turns out that there were 213 sites and, and um, 80 of the 213 sites agreed to what we call the first antirhythmic drug sub-study. And what happened is when patients were, and we, this was because we had the ch chance for the first time to compare head-to-head -head all the antirhythmic drugs that were available that had never been possible before. Because in the trial, if you got randomized to the rhythm control arm, you could choose whatever drug you wanted. You saw the many that were there. But this trial said if you get randomized to the rhythm control arm at 80 sites, you got randomized either to amiodarone, to sodalol, or to one of the class 1A or 1 three drugs, the class 1 drugs. And the, the primary outcome was who at the end of one year was still in sinus rhythm, on, had not been cardioverted, and were on the same drug. And if you can see this, 
Amiodarone, this, the yellow is the people who fulfilled that, uh, those, those endpoints, that amiodarone beat uh, the class one drugs. Amiodarone beat Sotalol very easily, and there was no significant difference between Sotalol and the class one drugs. But that's not the message of this. This was a strategy. And so you can either cardiovert the patient this light green color, or uh, you can put them on drug B instead of drug A. And if you did that, at the end of one year, you can see about 80% of the patients were on sinusrhythm. And the point is that recurrence is not failure per se. It's the frequency of recurrence, it's the symptoms of recurrence and the like. So that's what this slide is meant to say. As with heart failure or angina, success in managing atrial fibrillation can be defined as the decrease in the frequency of episodes, duration of episodes, and symptoms during episodes. So I have patients over the years who have a, an occasional recurrence. We cardiovert them, and they come home. They go home. We don't see them for a long time. And some of them even just cardiovert themselves spontaneously. It's not recurrence. So the story I love most uh, was, was some of you may remember Dale Adler. He was our chief of cardiology at one time. We were following a patient together. He called me one Saturday. Mr. So-and-so has failed amiodarone. And I said, to him, we haven't seen him for a long time. What, what is it? He said, yes, yeah, two years. I said, well, cardiovert him and hope we don't see him for another two years. And his remark, I wish you remembered, why didn't I think of that? And the point was, it's a mindset. It's really an approach to how you do this. And I think that's really important. Okay. So, in summary for that point, what, what is good rhythm control? No AF, outstanding. You keep them on the drug. Mark decrease in AF frequency and duration. That's pretty darn good, and may, probably you want to keep going. What about a modest decrease in AF frequency and duration? That, that's maybe okay, and not great, maybe, but you have to consider a, a, drug, a drug change at the very least. Don't give up on this strategy. And if there's no change, you have to decide whether you want to try other drugs or you want to go to another strategy. Now, this is another important thing that we got out of the AFFIRM trial, and, and this has stood the test of time as well. So back in 1995, when we started the AFFIRM trial, um, the notion was one of the advantages of sinus rhythm, there were many, it was thought, and one of the advantages of sinus rhythm was that you didn't have to be anticoagulated. And nobody wanted to be anticoagulated if they didn't have to be. And we knew that atrial fibrillation tended to recur. The data said that. It's 50% recurrence rate in six months to a year, even back in 1995, those data were there. However, um, when we proposed that you, you stay on anticoagulation for a prolonged period, this, virtually every single site said the same thing. We're not going to be able to randomize patients to the trial if we can't stop in sinus rhythm. So what wound up happening was that if you were in sinus rhythm for a month, you could stop the, you could stop the anticoagulation. So this is what happened when the trial ended. You can see there was no difference in the stroke rate between those in the rate control arm and the rhythm control arm. None at all. The p-value was 0.79. But look at this. The people who got strokes in the rhythm control arm, it was 79% were either not taking warfarin, which was 57%, or the INR was less than 2 now, what was interesting and important also about warfarin and even anticoagulation is that in the rate control arm, it was a protocol violation not to be taking warfarin, and, you know, one-third of the patients who got a stroke were not taking it. We know that there's a dropout rate of at least 20% every year, and these, even in the big new oral anticoagulant trials, it's the same thing. And, again, the difficulty with warfarin in keeping people in the therapeutic range, you can see that 36% uh, of the patients had an INR less than 2. So the, the lesson was once on warfarin, Maybe always on warfarin, or now, you know, anticoagulation just because you get sinus rhythm is not enough reason to stop per se. So then there were other there were other major trials. At the AFFIRM trial, the RACE trial was a trial in the Netherlands that was published in the New England Journal at the same time, a much smaller trial, but came to the same conclusions as the AFFIRM trial. By the way, there were there were no benefits of uh, sinus rhythm in this study uh, compared to uh, uh, things like quality of life. It's, uh, there are a whole bunch of things. We don't have time to go into that whole lecture. But the bottom line is that there were also a lot of small studies, and the major overall findings were the same. Rhythm, a rhythm control strategy a rhythm control strategy was not superior to a rate control strategy in terms of outcome, that is morbidity and mortality. Appropriate choice of therapy should be based on each person's symptoms and disease. It's an individual thing. But then we get to heart failure. There were very few heart failure patients. Out of 4,060 in the AFFIRM trial, there were only 339 patients who had a class 2 uh, New York Heart Association classification or worse. But at the time, it was thought that atrial fibrillation uh, is thought to influence prognosis in patients with heart failure. 
as a result of adverse hemodynamics due either to excessive ventricular rate, which we know is true, uh, irregular ventricular response rate, which may be true, and the loss of the atrial kick to cardiac output. So, well, as far as rate, we know about that. It's called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, a tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy. So a prolonged rapid ventricular rate res uh, response, uh, usually in excess of 100 beats per minute, may or, may or often will lead to a tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy and to uh, exacerbate the, uh, or exacerbate AF. The ventricles dilate with a very rapid rate. So if you put them back to sinus rhythm, you do very well, although sometimes they're left with a little diastolic compliance problems for a while. But so what role, if any, the irregular ventricular response rate plays in atrial fibrillation, the R until we know it's classically irregular, is a whole separate lecture also about the mechanics of contraction, but some think it's important. In any event, we do have some information. This is from Hopkins quite a while ago now, but they looked at, at the um, functional impact of rate irregularity in patients with heart failure and atrial fibrillation uh, receiving uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. That means five ventricular pacing, okay? And what they concluded was in heart failure subjects with atrial fibrillation, the RR interval irregularity um, worsens cardiac function is elevated, but not at normal rate, uh, heart, rate, heart rate range. Overall, the overall rate control is the most important of these pa uh, in these patients, while the rate regularization of uh, rapid atrial fibrillation may impart uh, additional benefits. So still not sure. I'll show you some data on that. But the irregular RR interval, maybe you remember from medical school, but if after a premature ventricular beat, there's a compensatory pause, but you have an increased force of contraction of the next beat, and that has a metabolic cost. So there are some reasons why, why people have thought about that. Okay. So then comes the AACHF trial. That was done by the Canadian government, a firm with the NIH, but the, but the Canadians realized that there were a lot of heart failure patients. We didn't have enough information. So they really essentially did the AFFIRM trial in Canada and all over the world, in fact. And the hypothesis was that restoring and maintaining sounding rhythm will reduce cardiovascular mortality by 25% compared to a rate control strategy in patients with congestive heart failure. That was the mantra at the time. And don't forget, these data came from a time when we didn't have airflow reducers, we didn't use beta blockers, I didn't know about using them in heart failure, and a whole bunch of things that we treat now. So the protocol was, it was a prospective multi-center trial with patients randomly allocated to two treatment uh, arms and a minimum follow-up of two years. It went from 2001 to 2007, a very good, long and very good trial. And um, almost 14,000 patients with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35 with symptoms of heart failure, New York heart class two to four with a history of, um, of AF. And um, they would randomize to rhythm control or rate control and follow for a minimum of two years. The primary endpoint was cardiovascular mortality, a bunch of secondary endpoints, so which I'll show you in a moment. Well, the shocker was when the trial ended, there was absolutely no difference between the rhythm and rate control. And we don't get expected to be at least 25% uh, improvement in mortality with sinus rhythm, not, not found. And uh, more than that, when you look at all the, all the sub-studies, this is death from any cause, stroke, worsening heart failure, com composite, uh, uh, comp uh, composite uh, outcomes, there was no difference at all. And that was really stunning until we, we looked at something which I think is a very, very telling thing, which gets back to my, one of my earlier slides about treat the comorbidities. They were remarkably well treated here. Um, uh, they had uh, beta blockers where 80 to 88 percent of the patients on beta blockers, this is with heart failure now. Uh, after the reduces with, uh, with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, in this group, it was, uh, and this is the rhythm control arm, was 95 percent. The rate control, it was even higher. It was, um, uh, yeah, it was the same, well, I guess 82 and 13, so that's 95, 81, and this is 97 percent, so really pretty good. They were, look at the diuretics, again, even spironolactones, and this is spectacular. Oh, 90 to 80, 90% of the patients were taking an oral anticoagulant. Now, we're lucky in even all these clinical trials, we know that you're lucky at 40 to 60% of patients with a clear indication of the anticoagulation and no contraindication even get it. And so this is really terrific, and I think it made a very big difference. Even the statin era, it was important. However, we didn't know about heart failure. And now there have been a whole bunch of trials that have looked at a whole lot of things. I, I, this is not anything I want to read for any reason except what I highlighted. 
Uh, these are all trials, but they're all very small, 58 patients, 37 patients, 41 patients, uh, 26, 69 patients, 26 uh, patients, small numbers in which they, they use surrogates for heart failure. They use ejection fractions. They use 60-minute walk tests, things like that. Uh, but not not and not anything like mortality or heart failure, hospitalization or anything. And uh, all of them showed some modest changes, but the, 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 most of the studies only went six months. You know, a few went a year. Very rarely did it go even longer. And uh, so we, we're really not sure where we are. But if you go back and look at the at the um, ASCHF trial, which was really interesting, and the group assigned to the rhythm control arm, they all got amiodarone, but all of them didn't stay in sinus rhythm, but so they broke it down into those who were in, heart, in, in sinus rhythm 80, more than 80 percent, less than 20 percent. They divided them into different 20-year uh, uh, periods. The bottom line is, if, if you look at patients who were in atrial fibrillation, uh, atrial fibrillation most of the time, or sinus rhythm most of the time, when the population was partitioned into two groups according to the proportion of time spent in sinus rhythm, that is high or low, um, this was 92% versus 12%, there was no difference in outcome, none. And so they concluded that a rhythm control strategy was not associated with better outcomes in patients with AF and CAR failure, even when analysis was performed to consider uh, efficacy in sinus rhythm and maintenance. In other words, if you maintain sinus rhythm, did it make a difference? It didn't seem to. So from this study, it was no obvious, I know I shouldn't say obvious, there's no um, uh, no clear reason why well, most people conclude that it's just a marker, that really the underlying problem is the myocardium itself from other reasons and not, and not the irre irregular rate. So uh, this is from George Weiss, um, who is the father of the AFFIRM trial, in fact, but a very wise guy. George Weiss does with a Y here. But I wanted to just read this a little because it's really good. It's just looked at the impact of atrial fibrillation, catheter ablation compared to other rhythm control management strategies. So we now, I'm going to show you the atrial fibrillation data, um, ablation data in a moment, but the bottom line is whether catheter ablation in the, in, uh, with the objective of maintaining sinus rhythm materially changes the approach to pharmacologic rate control and rhythm control remains to be determined. And the same thing is true uh, for you know, see pharmacologic rate or rhythm control. Um, Non-randomized cohort studies and, and randomized studies using surrogate uh, outcomes like left ventricular ejection fraction have not been robust enough to conclusively compare pharmacologic rhythm or rate control to catheter ablation or rhythm control. However, most data from several small studies are promising. Uh, that is, if you look at uh, ablation, that was, you find that's that's really what I didn't mention here. These are all studies with catheter ablation. But if you look at uh, people in, in sinus rhythm, there were some small changes, but short follow-up and then small numbers. So we await two randomized trials that are uh, coming in probably uh, very soon, the RAF trial and the Castle AF, which randomized patients prospectively, not a small study and without randomization even. And now, there's another thing to remember if, if you want to pursue sinus rhythm, it's the pill in the pocket. There are patients who have atrial fibrillation episodically. They're in sinus rhythm most of the time. So when they have it, um, how, they, this is an idea that they can take medication and convert themselves. That's called the pill in the pocket. So the, the, this study was done in Italy very, very well by Alboni. Uh, in patients with no left ventricular dysfunction, valvula or ischemic heart disease, and infrequent, symptom, uh, infrequent but symptomatic episodes of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and with a systolic blood pressure greater than 100 millimeters of mercury and a resting rate of uh, greater than 70 beats per minute. Um, uh, they did a study to understand how and when to take medication. So this was the protocol. Patients who had paroxysmal atrial fib, they, they, um, they had to be on anticoagulation when appropriate. And, and this is the pill in the pocket therapy and if they got it, they were given either flecainide or propofenone uh, in big doses of flecainide, 300 milligrams propofenone, 600 milligrams single dose, or just rate control. And when the trial ended, it was really remarkable. So this in the yellow are patients with paroxysmal fib, whoops, patients with paroxysmal fib, and this is how many emergency room visits they had, uh, and this is how many hospitalizations they had. But then if you look at the next year, those same patients who were now in the trial, um, you can see that 
the emergency room visits were remarkably down, and so were the hospitalizations. And it turns out when you take one of these drugs, most people convert within two hours. That's pretty good. And so for patients who have intermittent atrial fibrillation, this is a pretty good way to do it. Now, if you look at the guidelines, there will be new guidelines coming out soon. These are from 2014 for the American guidelines. And it just shows you that the drugs that you use, it depends on, a little bit on underlying structural heart disease or not. But what I wanted to show you is that amiodarone here is only the drug of second choice, not a first choice. That's not really how the people practice, but that's what we do. And it, a lot of it depends on the underlying disease, ischemic heart disease. You can't give the 1C agents because they uh, increase the likelihood of, of ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. And if they have lethargic dysfunction, uh, you can't give donetarone. And if they have heart failure, you can't give dofetilide because the, the QT prolongation becomes a real problem with torsad. But what the guidelines said, is they introduced the notion that some patients can go directly to catheter ablation as a primary as a primary choice, so, um, or as a secondary, if you fail these drugs, you go to ab catheter ablation. So we're going to spend some time on that. But so you can see, and if you have this, no structural heart disease, you can go directly. But even if you have structural heart disease, a coronary disease, or um, heart failure, you can go right to ablation. So what are the data about that? So I'd like to show this slide because it's an old one, but it really shows what the data tell me and, um, and, the, and the FDA, by the way. I helped present some of these data to the FDA a while ago. The, uh, the average age of people who have successful age relation is in the middle 50s. And, uh, and, uh, and not only that, um, they have no structural heart disease and they have just and they have patches of atrial fibrillation. So that's the only hope, and we'll go into why that might be. But, in other, but, uh, but the problem is that most patients don't fit that category. You know, right now, more than half the patients with atrial fibrillation are over age 75, and soon it will be two-thirds over 75 and, and, and half over 80. So we're, we're really not talking about most people for, in this category. And what's the long-term efficacy following catheter ablation? Well, uh, it's not very good. Um, study, uh, do, and, uh, I'll show you these data. These are the data from, um, from Hesseger. Hesseger is one of the best laboratories in the world, or in, in Bordeaux, Paris, um, in Bordeaux, France. Um, he's the one who taught us that the atrial fibrillation is almost always initiated by premature beats coming from the pulmonary veins. And uh, uh, in any event, we, we really still don't understand the mechanism of atrial fibrillation. Some of us think we have a handle on it now, but it's really a, been a struggle for a lot of important reasons we can discuss later. But it's, it's such a complex arrhythmia, with, and the, the atria uh, look chaotic, and it's not easy to figure out. In any event, Hesseger showed this. Uh, when he looked at a, a follow-up of ablation, uh, patients undergoing catheter ablation, arrhythmia-free survival rates um, after a single ablation procedure were 40 percent, 37 percent, and 26 percent at one, two, and five years. Uh, respectively, that is, and uh, with most recurrences over the first six months. So you can see this is the first six months, and this is over the five-year period. Uh, by five years of follow-up, freedom from recurrent atrial fibrillation was 63%, although uh, repeat interventions were more than half the patients. And repeat interventions is plural. Could be two or three. I saw a patient at seven ablations once. That's, I think, rare, but it, it happened. And, um, and although most AF recurrences occurred over the first six to 12 months, uh, a slow but steady decline in arrhythmia-free survival was noted thereafter with a 9% annual recurrence rate following the last ablation. So then you should notice other things. These are volunteer, volunteer uh, data uh, that uh, Ricardo Copato from Milan uh, put together a worldwide survey. So it was over 16,000 patients. I'll just highlight a few things. Uh, if you look at this, uh, there, there was a death rate associated with the procedure. That the point is small but, but real. And if you look at this at Tampanade, again, there was uh, over a 1% incidence. And the most recent data from Stanford say in the community is 8%. If you look at strokes, if people get strokes, you can transfer the ischemic attacks to get that too. So the overall event rate of these bad things is almost 5%. But uh, the thing that's really interesting to me also is that 
a lot of these patients get what we call atypical atrial flutter. When they do atrial fibrillation, the only thing they understand is that if you isolate the pulmonary veins, you isolate the triggers, so maybe even though there's a vulnerable atrial substrate, the, the triggers will, will not be able to, to get to the substrate until you, you stop atrial fibrillation, and that seems to have some efficacy. Um, but um, what happens is they do more than that because it, it, um, it isn't enough in so many patients. And they make what they call lines, ablative lines. These lines often become the point of make of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an area around which a reentrant circuit can circulate, an area of block. And so you get what we call atypical or atrogenic atrial flutter, which has been reported that this thing is almost 9%. So if you add this up, it's 14 to 15% incidence of side effects. And then there's some other things, too. Um, so I'll, I'll let me talk about surgical ablation. It's the maze procedure. In the interest of time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. But the, the, it's a uh, reward to success rate is about 70%. Some say up to 95, but that's very short term. And the, the rigor, permit me, I hope there are no surgeons in the audience, but the surgical follow up is, I, I know that a very good group in, in Washington, Wash in the St. Louis, because I asked them, their follow up was they called the referring physician, they so and so in sinus rhythm, and said, yes, this is great, and that patient was still in sinus rhythm. Hardly acceptable. In any event, um, what I'm going to show you the data from Gilinoff, who when they find what they did with the maze procedure uh, in a moment, and they, they found that the only thing that really worked reliably was isolating the pulmonary veins. So all the other lesion tests that they made didn't help. And in catheter ablation, about 70% success rates, uh, that is atrial fibrillation uh, free more than a year or more, but the definition of success has been variable. Best success has been in patients with lone, that is no, no uh, um, comorbidities, lone atrial fibrillation and perhaps with atrial fibrillation with less than 65. AF recurrences are high, and um, neither optimal lesion sets nor targeted ablation uh, are available. So um, I want to talk about heart failure now, and um, I'm, I'm, I want to get into this uh, that was out of order. I think I screwed that up this morning. In any event, what I wanted to show you by catheter ablation again is that in, a total in hospital deaths in a, in, a, uh, in a big cohort of patients that was put together by Stanford looking at ablations from 2000 to 2010, uh, and the numbers of procedures were from 3367 in the year 2000 to 12,000 in the year 2010. This came from a huge database. As 0.5 percent break, basically it's one in every 200 patients has a mortality, and I think that's important. In any event, there's still other things that are very bothersome about this, and a lot of people ignore this. You know, you're playing on the left atrium, on the left side, and when you're ablating endocardially, whether it be cryo or whether it be with radio frequency, you're left with a very rough tissue. That's a source of clot formation. So anticoagulation is critical, but some people actually did some studies. Cognitive function following radio frequency ablation. Cognitive function measured in eight neuropsych, uh, neuropsych tests uh, that in patients with paroxysmal fib, persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, uh, just an SVT, that's super paroxysmal super chicken tachycardia, not fibrillation at all. You wouldn't expect anything in these patients who had um, atrial fibrillation but, but no radio frequency ablation, so atrial fib without any ablation. So a post-operative cognitive dysfunction uh, was significant, significant fa failure on, on two or more tests that they studied and a uh, more generalized subtle uh, decline in eight tests. So they tried to look uh, at, uh, rigorously as they could to see if there was a change. So the bottom line is post-operative cognitive, cognitive dysfunction was present at 90 days in eight of 60 patients, that's 13% of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients, 20% of persistent atrial fibrillation patients, and only 3% in SVT patients, and none in patients who had no ablation at all. So the bottom line is, you know, even small, small infarcts, some of these infarcts, uh, some of the emboli are a pencil point size, and, and we know that if you get them, it can have all kinds of effects, uh, even in patients who are not ablated. So uh, I think that's important. So this is a picture of the MAGE procedure. The, every hospital, every, every surgeon, cardiac surgeon with their soul does it. And let me just show you, because this was published initially in 1988 uh, from Jimmy Cox. So this is the left atrium here, the right atrium over here. And you can see these are the pulmonary veins. And so um, these, what Jimmy Cox said, if atrial fibrillation is due to multiple reentrant wavelets or random reentry, which was thought so at the time, although there were no data to back that up, 
Um, he said, if I make incisions all over the atria and sew them up, they'll heal by fibrosis. And fibrosis is non-conducting tissue, so these random reentry wavelets will hit the fibric area, fibrotic area and stop. So in other words, most reentry is, is uh, going around in a circle with the head chasing the tail, the head of excitability chasing the tail, refractors. But random reentry was not that at all. There was no surface movement at all. So he, here are some of the lesions that he made in the cut and sew, as it was called. This is in the right atrium, spurry vena cava here. And you can see in the left atrium. But the first thing he did was isolate the pulmonary veins. This was in 1988. And the reason was because back then, the uh, guy named Jack Poirot, working with him, who was a good electrophysiologist, said, you know, there's a theory that atrial fibrillation is due to reentry around the pulmonary veins. And so they did that. It turns out that that's the most important thing that they did. And this is the way, because Hesseger, a decade later, in 1998, uh, reported that, uh, that, pul that pulmonary veins, here, this is the right superior, left superior, left inferior, left su uh, uh, right inferior. These are where the pulmonary uh, the triggers of the pulmonary veins start. There's some that don't start there. It's 90 to 95% come from the pulmonary veins. So if you isolate the pulmonary veins like you do this, you prevent them from getting out, and so you won't get atrial fib, was the hope, and it seems it's pretty good, especially in paroxysmal fibrillators. So the maze procedure is now up to maze four. That was maze one. I only want to show you, because there's a whole lot of lines. You still isolate the pulmonary veins, all kinds of lines, and then they even apply cryo as well as uh, radio frequency. It's not worth spending time on. It's worth spending time on this. This was published in the New England Journal in 2015. Mark Yonah from the Cleveland Clinic led the group. It was the first time they did a, a randomized prospective trial on the maze procedure. But what really they did is these are all people coming to, uh, to surgery for valvular heart disease with atrial fibrillation. They divided them in. Half would get amiodarone, and the other half would get a, a maze procedure. But of the group that got the maze procedure, half would get only a pulmonary vein isolation, and the others would get a pulmonary vein isolation, and all those other lesions that I'm showing you here. Uh, this is... Uh, here to the left atrial appendix here. These are all lesions that they're doing. These are endocardial. Anyway, the bottom line was that um, freedom from atrial fibrillation, uh, if you had mitral valve surgery, if you had um, just the mitral valve surgery alone, the recurrence, uh, the, the difference in percentage of the freedom, the 25%, about 29% had freedom just from the mitral valve surgery. But if you add mitral valve surgery plus ablation, it was up to 63%. That was a significant difference. But this was the thing that was striking. If you look at the patients who had a biatrial maze procedure, that all the lines and everything else was 66%. But if you look at those who only had pulmonary vein isolation, it was 61%. There's no significant difference, and those data have been confirmed. So the only thing they're doing with all those lines, it looks like, is isolating the pulmonary veins. So we need to understand this more. So Gillenoff concluded that the addition of atrial, the addition of atrial fibrillation ablation for mitral valve surgery significantly increased the rate of freedom from atrial fibrillation at one year amongst patients with persist, for long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. But the risk of, of implantation of a permanent pacemaker was also increased because all those lines they made, you know, uh, here this is where the sinus node is and the, uh, things like that. They they, they needed pacemakers. Okay, so. What's the current role of catheter-based AF ablation in patients uh, and patient management? So who are the appropriate candidates? There are some. Uh, failure to respond to one or more endorhythmic drugs is one of the reasons you might want to think about it. Paroxysmal atrial is the best persistent or long-standing persistent. That they have the lowest rate of efficacy. In the best studies, they're about 40% efficacy in one year. Uh, age 75 or younger, but, but the upper age limit is still changing a bit. Do you go diablate people in their 80s even? But the bottom line is that the younger you are, the more likely you are to have efficacy from these things. The left atrium can't be markedly dilated. If it's markedly dilated, doing any of these things is a waste of time. And if patients are highly symptomatic um, uh, with impaired quality of life, give it a try. Possibly with uh, contraindications to anticoagulation, but the left atrial occlusion uh, 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 devices are now used, and uh, and also the, the surgeons usually lock off the left atrial appendage at the time of surgery. So maybe that's going to make some difference in patients who can't take anticoagulations. A patient have to be willing to accept major complication risks, and I showed you it could be as much as 13 to 15 percent. 
willing to accept a, a high AF recurrence rate, and that's really true in, the, in both the ablation uh, surgery and ablation with catheters. So then what are the indications? I think symptomatic AF refractory to intolerant uh, or intolerant class one or class three drugs. Um, in rare uh, clinical situations, it may be appropriate to perform AF ablation as first line of therapy. Selected symptomatic patients with heart failure and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, it may be. But it looks like when you look hard at the data, even though it's, a, it's small data, it looks like the people who benefit are the ones who really have depressed ventricular dysfunction. EF ejection fraction less than 30. That's most, that most people who are say are not in that category when you're treating them. They're 35, 40, 45, that sort of thing. And the, the presence of left atrial thrombus is a contraindication, so that's pretty obvious. So some general issues for ablation. What makes this procedure more difficult than ablation of other arrhythmias? We, AV, AVNRT, that's with Wolf Parkinson, right? We ablate the bypass pathway. It's easy. We have a target, uh, I mean, AV, AVRT. AVNRT, we entry in the AV node. We have a target, the slow pathway. Um, atrial flutter, we have a target, the so-called okay, cave because of the isthmus. We, we know we're going to get success to an approach about 100%. We have a target. We don't yet have that real target except pulmonary vein isolation and atrial fibrillation. So the procedure is, is an empiric procedure for the most part. What are the targets? What are the endpoints? And the relationship between AF and triggers uh, and atrial substrate that sustains atrial fibrillation is not well understood. AF is probably a combination of different conditions with different mechanisms and variable um, uh, atrial areas. Um, you know, we're not sure if it's both atrial, one atrial, or whatever. We still have to learn that. Left-sided ablation increases the increases risks because you're playing on the left side. It's really CNS risk and tamponade as well. Um, difficult anatomy. Uh, you know, uh, pa patients are, are not all the same, but that we're getting to understand that a lot more. Um, different modalities of procedures. There are radio frequency ablation. There's cryo. There's even now laser, and there are different mapping techniques to try and find these places that. Are, some of them, in my judgment, are not yet established. Long-term follow-up is troubling, and the endpoints used in oral anticoagulation are uncertain. Um, my my uh, strict constructionism is that if you have stroke risk, you, you don't stop the anticoagulation even though you appear to have sinus rhythm and unless you're sure over a prolonged period because the stroke's a terrible thing. So the mechanism that sustains AFib is not known. I put this in. Uh, we've been mapping atrial fibrillation of the OR with the surgeons, with Dr. Markowitz particularly, and we think we have some uh, new, new things. We've published it already. We think the atrial fibrillation is due to foci that are firing and that we think they become targets. This is a, a project that we're, uh, we're on top of now. So what are the reasons to consider answer to drug therapy before ablation, despite recognizing that atrial fibrillation is tough to suppress, per se, with drug therapy? Well, why might you think about it? Satisfactory AFib suppression may be acceptable. Occasional AFib recurrence is not failure per se. Then there's the pill in the pocket approach for some patients. And then there's one that I didn't mention. In patients with atrial fibrillation, if you give them a class 1C agent, sodium channel blocking agent, in about 15% of patients, um, it'll, convert, it'll convert the atrial fibrillation to atrial flutter. But we know how to ablate atrial flutter. That's really good. And it turns out if you maintain, if you have late the atrial flutter and maintain the drug therapy, 80% of those patients will never have FIB again, and 100% of them won't have flutter. That's a separate story, but if you, you need to have FIB to have flutter, that's another lecture. Uh, temporizing gives time for, for better therapies to develop. I think that's true. Uh, when including our atrogenic atrial flutter as an adverse event, the, the complication rate for AFib ablation is about 15% with a mortality rate of almost 0.5. So um, there are real issues with cognitive function, secondary to CNS embolization during AF ablation. And because the AF, of, because the AF recurrence rate uh, post-ablation is high, about 50% in five years, and recurrence is three to seven times more likely to be asymptomatic, they don't know they're in it, uh, oral anticoagulation is still recommended where CHADS FASC score of two or more. So, um, the final slide, thera AF therapy maintaining sinus, if you want to maintain sinus rhythm, it's usually uh, a, a patient-specific uh, 
it's usually patient specific. You have to individually decide on an individual basis. It, it, it may be a symptom driven decision. It requires individualized drug selection also. It requires realistic objectives. That's maybe the main thing I'm talking about. AF recurrence is not failure per se. Reduced atrial fibrillation frequency, duration, and severity may be fine. Candidates for ablation and ablation itself are still evolving. And so, and the role for combined therapy, they now have, we didn't touch on that at all, but drug therapy, device therapy, and ablation is being looked at as, as something. So that's a, a, a quick run through of a very complex thing. I didn't talk much about rate control because I, we were trying to talk about sinus rhythm, but rate control is a legitimate primary therapeutic option. And um, I'm not saying that we all would like to stay in HFib, but given all the circumstances, you could do very well. I, I tell a story, I'll just tell, I'll end with this. A couple of years ago, I was on the weekend call for the electrophysiology service, and a, a, a physician was admitted. He was a, 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 an OBGYN guy in his 80s. We'd gone to see his doc, uh, and he, his doc found he was in atrial fibrillation. He sent him in on Saturday. He said, the AP0, so we'll see you in cardiovascular on Monday. We got to see him. He was on atrial fib. He didn't know he was in it, and so he didn't know when it had been. He'd only seen his doc a year, early, uh, six months earlier, so he had no idea when it started, how long he was in it. More than that, on no medication, his ventricular rates were, were, were already controlled. So he had AV node dysfunction, and we also know that it means sinus node dysfunction. So if we successfully cardiovert him, he's going to need a pacemaker. And, still, and then um, we're not going to make him feel better. And he's still going to have to take anticoagulation, whatever he does. So we gave him the option. We said, you know, you have no symptoms. We walked him around the corridor. His rate went up satisfactorily. So uh, we gave him the option, and he chose to go home and watch the football games, as he said. And I think that was wise. We, we didn't say he shouldn't be cardioverted. Some people think everybody should get at least one try. I think this is a good example where I don't think it was a good idea because you know that with the sinus node dysfunction, all kinds of problems. And this this guy was happy. He's going to have to take anticoagulation anyway. And that was fine. That's a long way to get to the end, but thank you very much. <laughs>